Okay, members, we will now move on to questions to the Minister of Health, and I call Daglan Magalier to ask the first question. Mr. Magalier. Uh, Kesh Everhain, question number one. And I call the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member for his question. Um, the Health and Social Care Board, through the Primary Care Infrastructure Development Programme, is taking forward planned investment in primary care premises across Northern Ireland, and that will be based on a hub and spoke model. Carrigmore Health Centre is a spoke of the OMA hub, and it is recognised that due to the growing size of the GP practice, it is now operating in space which is well below its capacity requirements. It has therefore been identified as a priority for capital investment. However, uh, due to many competing priorities across Northern Ireland, it is likely that new provision in Carrickmore will be a longer term priority, unless significant new capital funding can be provided. In 2019, the Western Health and Social Care carried out works to convert two old dental rooms to provide additional GP practice space within the Carrickmore Health Centre to meet the urgent and immediate needs of the practice. A requirement for funding to commence new health centre provision in Carrickmore was identified by my department as part of a recent Department of Finance-led four-year capital budget information gathering exercise. However, since that exercise, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's November spending review now covers 2021-22 year only, and therefore my ability to take this project forward is subject to the confirmation of future budget allocations. However, once a capital budget is available, the Health and Social Care Board will work with the Western Health and Social Care Trust to take forward the preparation of the business case to identify the, prefer to identify the preferred option. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. And I should declare an interest being a, a registered patient at the Carrickmore Health Centre. I am glad that the Minister had noted that this is a, um, has identified this as a priority for capital investment, albeit in, in the longer term. Does the Minister recognise that, given the fact that we have an ageing population and that the Carrickmore Health Centre serves a very large, dispersed rural population, which has huge implications for isolation and indeed ambulance response times, and the fact that we are amongst the farthest away from any acute service? That this area should, this particular health area should be prioritised for investment. Graham Abbott. I think, as I already covered um, in my initial statement or the initial answer to the question that the member uh, raised, I do. But as I said, in regards to the recent funding allocation, which is only for one year, that does put pressure on that. But I will say that a number of hubs uh, for the Tyrone and Fermanagh area are envisaged within the strategic implementation plan, and that includes OMA. Enniskillen, Lisnesky, Dungannon, Strabana and Cookstown. And the hubs within Oma and Enniskillen are now operational. Uh, the business case even for the hub in Lisnesky is currently under review and will be followed by a business case for the Dungannon hub. The Health and Social Care Board is also investing in the development of spokes, which will take the form of smaller health centres and is working with the Western Health and Social Care Trust to explore the need to invest in trust-owned health centres. And in addition, GP practices within GP owned or leased premises can also apply to the Health and Social Care Board for grants to support the development of their premises. Call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank the Minister for his update on those hubs. Can the Minister provide an update on the activity of the GP uh, COVID centres? Um, I, I thank the member for, for, for his question um, because the establishment of primary care COVID centres. Uh, was an urgent and immediate response to the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, and they assured the primary care services could be maintained by enabling patients who have COVID-19 symptoms to be treated separately from those patients who have other conditions which require assessment or treatment in primary care. Uh, the staffing and operation of those centres is managed locally by GP federations in response to local demand. Primary care COVID centres have been crucial to ensuring that GP practices have been able to continue to deliver vital services and face-to-face -face appointments for patients, and have greatly reduced the flow to emergency departments. Between the 6th of April and the 22nd of November this year, there were 109,697 COVID-related queries to GP practices. 23,022 of those patients were triaged and referred to primary COVID centres, with 15 per cent of patients assessed at these centres then referred to secondary care. The week uh, from Monday the 19th to Sunday the 25th of October saw 1,045 referrals, the highest ever weekly number of referrals since the centres opened. Well, Daniel McCrossan. Uh, 
thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answers to the questions so far. Uh, Minister, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge the important role that health centres play uh, right across our respective constituencies, particularly in rural constituencies such as mine and Mr. McAleer's. Uh, in relation to Carrick Moor, uh, has there been any projected costs for the necessary works uh, that um, uh, are needed to the, to the current health practice? Um, I'll thank the member you know, for his question, and I think that's in the, the final uh, sentence to the answer to Mr. Michael there, uh, was that once a capital budget is available, uh, the Health and Social Care Board will work with the Western Health and Social Care Trust to take forward the preparation of that business case to identify which will be their preferred option. But also, as I said, that due to the, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's spending review now only covering 2021 20, 2022, uh, my ability to take this project forward is subject to the confirmation of future capital budget allocations. I call Kelly Armstrong. Question number two. Um, and I thank the member. Uh, private baby scan studios are not included in the list of regulated establishment and agencies set out in the 2003 Health and Personal Social Services Order. However, if ultrasounds are carried out in these studio, studios by radiographers, the radiographers are regulated by the Health and Care Professional Council. Also, independent hospitals and clinics may carry out private baby scans, and these establishments are regulated by the Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority under the 2003 Order and the Independent Health Care Regulations of 2005. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, as you are probably aware, the, Qu the Care Quality Commission had growing concern about failures to discover serious medical issues during private baby scans in England. So, could I ask, Minister, um, while you say that some of those places are not regulated, but the radiographers may be, um, what assurances can you give to families here that um, serious medical conditions will not be missed? Um, and I thank the member, and I think it's it's the valid point uh, that her question does. Does, does get to the heart of, because there is a risk that these private baby scan studios do not tell women about an abnormality or serious condition. Um, pregnant women are offered at least two ultrasounds during pregnancy by the health and social care staff and through our systems, and that includes any anomaly scan at 18 to 20 weeks. Uh, so all private scans are addition to this. But in regards to, in regards to the, the specific regulatory framework, our QIA's regular activity is determined by the 2003 legislation, which reflects department policy at that time. And since then, the health and social care system has changed dramatically, both in how we access care and also in the type of care available. And that includes the rise of services available on high street and online. Statutory health and social care providers such as trusts who run our hospitals, as well as some primary care services like GP and community pharmacies, are not regulated by RQIA, but the professional staff working in these services are regulated. So that carries across in regards to, to my initial answer. Um, the Minister will be aware that the paediatric pathology service collapsed here a few years ago and is currently only accessible in Liverpool. Um, so I would like to ask, would the Minister um, explore with the Health Minister in Dublin the provision of an accessible paediatric pathology service here on the island, or even an inreach um, service into the north? Thank you. And, and I thank the member for the point. And again, it is one she has raised with me, me previously, because it is something I know she, she works on um, continually. Uh, we have been exploring a number of options, but. Um, the biggest challenge, and even that across all these islands, if not across part of the world, is, is the, the accessibility of paediatric pathologists, because it is quite an acquired skill set. Um, there is an opening call for recruitment for here in our health and social care service in Northern Ireland. We have explored models with the Republic of Ireland, but the one that we have operating at the minute is where we have that working ability with colleagues. Um, in, in the United Kingdom, it's not satisfactory. It doesn't provide the emotional support uh, that parents often need when they do do lose a child. It's something we're acutely aware of in the department across the health and social care sector, and something that we're, we're, we are working hard uh, to correct. But the availability of paediatric pathologists is the biggest challenge to us all. Well, Claire Bailey. Thank you, Speaker. Um, 
Can I ask if the Minister is aware of any incidences where uh, women trying to access baby scans at NHS or other um, premises are being blocked from doing so uh, in order to go to a private uh, provider? And if that is the case, what can be done in those circumstances? Um, I'm not aware of that having happened, but if the member has any specific examples that she knows of, I would appreciate if she could highlight it to my office, because the health and social care system, the National Health Service of Northern Ireland, is available for those who need it, free of point of use and free of point of delivery, and that's something I stand over. I call Matthew O'Toole. Mr Speaker. And I thank the member. Um, both our testing and track and trace programmes continue to evolve at pace. On testing as part of the UK-wide programme, we are continuing with implementation of a number of new testing interventions or NTIs in Northern Ireland. For example, testing of asymptomatic healthcare workers will begin this week. This NTI will enable early identification of SARS-CoV-2 virus in healthcare staff who do not have symptoms, ensuring frontline staff can self-isolate early and thereby reduce the risk of onward transmission of infection. Testing of asymptomatic students also commenced this week uh, at Queen's University using lateral flow devices with plans progressing to offer testing where this is needed to the wider population of students. The learning arising from these NTIs will help us better understand how these new asymptomatic testing technologies can be implemented and extended more widely. With regards to the contact tracing service, in addition to a number of digital enhancements, including a new self-trace platform, the Public Health Agency commenced enhanced contact tracing on the 16th of November. This is a significant development in our approach to combating the virus and will ensure a strong focus on identifying the likely source of a case of infection and identifying potential common exposures, which can lead to clusters. My staff and colleagues in the PHA are also continuing to work on a range of options to ensure that our contact tracing service is well positioned to deal with the pandemic in the coming months. This will involve the development of a hybrid model with a focus on further digital solutions to deliver early messages to contacts and cases, whilst at the same time allowing the health professional staff and the contact tracing service to risk assess and deal with more complex cases and with clusters and outbreaks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Minister for his answer. Uh, can I ask a couple of very brief follow-ups? One in relation to students travelling back, particularly from England, Scotland and Wales to Northern Ireland ahead of Christmas. Thus far, they have had very limited information from the Executive. I realise that is in part the responsibility of the Economy Minister, but um, the Health Minister has had a slightly better record at giving us straight answers. So if he could update on whether there will be specific advice to students travelling here for Christmas. Uh, in terms of tra testing and tracing. Secondly, in relation to the end of the transition period and, and uh, Brexit, we have talked about this before. Has he had clarity on whether, if there is not a deal on comprehensive data sharing equivalents by the end of this year, there will be complete certainty around cross-border data flows? Is, is he assured on that, uh, and can he be confident that that contact testing and tracing between, for example, Derry and Donegal won't be uh, jeopardised on New Year's Day? Um, I, I thank the member for, for his two supplementaries. In regards to, to the first, uh, information being given to students uh, who are coming home from England, Scotland and Wales will be provided by the university in which they are currently studying. And that advice and the, the, the testing method, the approach and, and the guidance that they must follow up will be provided by the source and the location at which that testing is provi being provided, and therefore information on their travel corridor will also be established. In regards to students who are currently domiciled in our own universities, um, either returning to England, Scotland or Wales, again, that advice will be given through uh, our, our testing system and, and the LTI that has already started in Queen's University at the start of last week. Uh, that will then be expanded to those students who are currently studying in Ulster University as well, so that we can allow them to travel home safely as well. In regards to, to the data sharing, in regards to your contact tracing, uh, because it is, is health-based, um, like the information that is transmitted between those patients who use the, the cancer services in Alton and Galvin, but also those parents and patients uh, who, use, who use the children's cardio cardiology service in Dublin, uh, because that is an agreement between our two governments, 
uh, and uh, well, the Irish Government and, and the Northern Ireland Assembly's Executive. That will not be affected by GDPR. Uh, where the current challenge comes in the sharing of that information is a difficulty that I have experienced in regards to the Irish Government's sharing of data uh, in specific in regards to travel locator forms. It has been the basis of many conversations and pieces of correspondence, but one that I have still not found a, a satisfactory resolution to. Colm Gillardy. Minister, we know that the contact tracing uh, model and preparations were inadequate here to meet the increased demand that we've seen at the start of this surge, uh, and that the inadequacy stemmed from poor modelling. Has the Department now addressed that inadequacy? Um, I, I think the, the members use of, of inadequacy. Um, I, I would challenge, and the member knows I've challenged that in the past, and I see Mr Sheehan looking at me because it's, it's an area of, of expertise that he, he has developed on. Um, but, but one of the things I will say, what we have seen uh, in the changes of our, our, our contact tracing system from the early onset of the pandemic to where we are now, we've made significant changes. For a system that was used to identify sexually transmitted Admitted infections to food poisoning, which was based on a very small team based in the public health agency, to what we actually have now, uh, where we are learning and always developing the system from what we see across best practice. We have in scaled and increased scale and continue to scale the number of contact tracers uh, who currently are available following up on that service. We are developing digital and online platforms to allow that information to be gathered at a rapid pace because we know the value that contact tracing always takes up. And one of the things, Mr Speaker, that we've always been clear of in Northern Ireland that our contact tracing system will be health based. It will remain uh, embedded within our health care system and it's not part of any private uh, for profit industry because we value the we, we value the value that it actually brings to our health service and how we actually combat the spread of COVID nineteen within Northern Ireland. Palm Cameron Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And I want to declare an interest as having a family member within that um, test trace protect scheme presently. Um, I certainly wouldn't um, describe the the, uh, the program as inadequate, but I think there is a case of we could do better at times. And has it, what I wanted to ask the Minister was: Has he looked at the Welsh model? of contact tracing with a view to upscaling and looking at how we can have a more meaningful communication uh, with checks and updates with those who have either tested positive or come into close contact with those who have tested positive in Northern Ireland. Uh, and again, I, I thank the member. I think there was a, a TV programme in regards which compared our, our service with the, well, the Welsh model. And, and uh, you'll appreciate that service models for contact tracing in Wales and Northern Ireland do have their differences. Um, as you're aware, the service provided by the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland is staffed by health professionals focusing very much on a person-led approach. This manual ele element is augmented by a number of digital-enabled solutions, uh, including the recently introduced self-trace platform and the Stop COVID NI app. In Wales, contact tracing is provided through local authorities and health boards, which are supported by Public Health Wales. But despite the differences in the models, it is still possible to draw some high-level comparison in performance. Um, for example, if we look at the seven-day period in Wales in mid-November, according to the latest published Welsh Government data, 92 per cent of positive cases were reached in the same period, uh, and 82 per cent of contacts were reached. In comparison, in Northern Ireland, if we look at a seven-day period around the same time, we can actually see that 94 per cent of positive cases were reached, and in the same period, 98 per cent of contacts were reached. So there are undoubtedly aspects of, of both models that work particularly well, and other areas that will require further refinement, and I think that is something we have been open about. But in Northern Ireland, I am satisfied that the measures which I recently discussed with both the Health Committee and the Executive, with an increase focused on a hybrid model involving manual contact tracing services supported by digital solutions will ensure that we are positioned to deal with any further increases in numbers in the months to come. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I uh, thank the Minister for his answers. Uh, can the Minister provide any update on his previous request to the UK Government for four million lateral flow tests? 
Um, I, I thank the member for his, for his question. We are uh, continuing to be in discussion with DHSC uh, through a very close working relationship we have as ministers across all four four nations in the United Kingdom. And Matt Hancock has been in reply to congratulate us on what will be an ambitious programme and will advance and is willing to discuss with us in regards how that will will actually work out in Northern Ireland as we take it forward. We have yet to, to see the outworkings of, of the pilots that have taken place in Liverpool and are now actually being taken place in Merthyr, Tidville as well, in Wales, uh, in our own system uh, at Queen's University, which will be currently rolled out across our health and social care system, to make sure that if we do receive that number of lateral flow devices, that we utilise them to, to, to the best and most effective use. I call Gary Middleton. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, and I thank the member. Um, I, I'll answer this question in respect of students uh, at the local universities uh, on health care courses commissioned by my department. I think it is very important that reassurance and support is provided to health care students that they will be able to push, pursue their stu studies despite the challenges created by the ongoing COVID 19 pandemic uh, to learning, learning during placements. This is a fundamental dimension of much pre-registration learning across the health professions. Officials in my department are working closely with key stakeholders, including the higher and further education providers, to ensure that students are made aware of the key messages. This will include guidance specific to each subject area issued by their university or education provider, and also the overall health guidance issued by the public health agency. In relation to nursing and midwifery, a joint statement from the four UK Chief Nursing Officers and the Nursing and Midwifery Council was issued on the 23rd of November to clarify the principles for nursing and midwifery students during the next phase of the pandemic. The overriding objective set out in this statement, which I consider as paramount, is to continue to support students to complete their programmes on time so that they can enter the workforce as registrants as quickly as possible. My officials have shared this statement with the local universities and have asked them to assured, ensure that it is communicated to all students. I am also fully committed to the supporting and continuation of medical and dental education. My officials accordingly continue to work with, very closely with Queen's University and other key stakeholders on the practical and financial implications of delivering education in clinical environments and comply with social distancing protocols. I have also confirmed to the universities that all such healthcare students will be entitled to avail of the free healthcare car parking at HSC Trust premises, which have been made available to HSC employees up until the 31st of March. And in addition, the universities have been advised that their healthcare students are key workers and are entitled to free public transport when travelling to placements. Gary Middleton, supplementary. Mr Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his response? Uh, the Minister will be aware that there is a lot of frustration among students um, given the lack of, of guidance, uh, particularly for them, particularly when it comes to travel uh, home for Christmas uh, for, as they enter into their second semester as well. Will the Minister uh, commit to working with the Executive to issue guidance similar to that which has been issued uh, by other counterparts in the UK? Um, as the Member will be aware, I work with all my Executive colleagues in regards to, to bringing forward guidance that is necessary, but in those regions and those areas where other ministers have policy lead, uh, it is helpful to us uh, that they actually bring forward that policy for discussion that we can provide information and guidance into, rather than my department uh, leading on, on areas that are without our policy area. I call John uh, Garmey, Minister. Several weeks ago, the Scottish Government introduced uh, about £1.3 million for mental health and care and wellbeing for students. I raised the matter with the Economy Minister a number of weeks ago, and I got a positive response to it. Would you approach the matter in a positive way and see if you can identify specific funding for our students and their mental health and wellbeing? Um, certainly. And the member well knows um, my commitment to mental health since coming into to this office, in fact, when the pandemic uh, first hit Northern Ireland, I give the assurances to the committee and its members and to this House that mental health would not go off the agenda of my department, and that's why we continued in regards to the development of the mental health strategy, which will lead to the mental health action plan. But also within that, we set specifically a piece of work in regards to what 
support mechanisms will be needed uh, for mental health with specifically fallout to COVID. So it, it's not something I would have any hesitancy in giving the member the reassurance with. So I'm equally uh, keen and supportive of working with the economy minister on this issue in support of our students. Call Paula Bradshaw. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Minister, to take you back um, to, the, to my South Belfast colleague's question there about the students travelling home, um, I have been um, contacted by parents who are concerned that they may get their asymptomatic testing at, on the campus, but between then and arriving home to their household bubble, they will be on a tube, a train, a bus, or a, a, a number of modes of transport and could well have picked it up in their journey home. Is there no way that you could be working with, the Ulsh, or sorry, with Queen's University so that some of that um, testing could take place for these students returning home as well? Um, I, I thank the member, but in regards to the testing that is being completed for our students to allow them to, to undertake that travel home, uh, it's done by the lateral flow devices which are actually being set up in the mass test, test centres uh, within our universities, so it's not uh, actually practicable to, to move that testing centre closer to the home uh, for, for the second test because they are such a diverse geographical region. But what I would say to those students who are returning uh, home at that point is to follow all public health guidance. Um, when they are using public public transport for face coverings, as much social distancing as is practicable, or if there are alternatives rather than using public transport, that they explore those and avoid car sharing, because we have seen uh, in previous studies in previous places where car sharing actually does become a source of infection as well. So I'm, I'm afraid to say to the member, because of the utilisation of the lateral flow devices and tests, it's not possible to move that second test actually closer to home because of, of the way the actual testing service or the test itself actually works. Call Rosemary Barton. Question five, Minister. And I, I, I thank the member for her question. Um, as members will be aware of the, over the last number of months, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the delivery of some services within our health and social care system. As a result of this, it is absolutely critical that we make the best use of all available capacity in the system. The member will recall she kindly invited me to the SWA earlier in the year. and During that visit, I saw firsthand the opportunities presented by the hospital. I am pleased to now to be able to confirm that a number of new initiatives have been taken forward to support service delivery as we work to maximise the use of all available capacity in the system. A key initiative that is currently develop, being developed in, is if, with regards to the delivery of electric sur, elective surgery services, with surgeons actually from across Northern Ireland travelling to Enniskillen to provide surgery that cannot currently be provided at other sites due to the numbers of COVID positive inpatients. In the initial phase, this work has understandably been focused on high priority patients requiring surgery. The initial sessions have been offered to Belfast Trust for surgical lists and time critical treatments, which have been displaced by the activation of the Belfast City Hospital Nightingale. Throughout the coming months, this position will be kept under review, and further work is underway to explore options for maximising the availability of all available capacity at the SWA in the longer term. Rosemary Barton, supplementary. Thank you. Minister, uh, I welcome this information. Um, Minister, can you, um, can, wouldn't you agree with me that having these extra, extra facilities now in the SWA will make it even more attractive for new staff to come and work within it? Um, very much so, and it's something that you know the Western Health and Social Care Trust is working on, and we've seen that uh, actually come about in in other areas and other facilities. But what I would say to the member: often the biggest deterrent from attracting staff to some of our excellent hospital and healthcare facilities is when members or other elected representatives start to talk about a service being downgraded or a location closing because it actually deters um, and disenfranchises people who may be interested in going to one of those sites to actually seek, seek further employment. So I think the implementation of what will be elective surgery lists in this wall is a further enhancement and something that makes it attractive for people to go to work there, as well as the opportunity, of course, to live in the members' constituency. That ends the period for a list of questions, members, and we will now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. Question one has been withdrawn, so I call Sinead Bradley. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, Minister, could I ask, the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine is now to undergo uh, a new global try and trial for, to, to further determine its efficiencies. Can you advise what effect that would have on our vaccination programme here? And I, I thank the member. Um, I'm, I'm assured by, by colleagues that that won't actually have any effect or setback in regards to our vaccine program, um, because our assessment will be done by MRHA, uh, and once that assessment comes forward, uh, we will hopefully be utilising uh, that vaccine in a safe and appropriate manner. And until that guarantee and that assurance does come forward, um, that will be the only point that we will utilise it here in Northern Ireland. Sinead Bradley, supplementary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Minister. A few weeks ago, you gave an assurance to this House. It was very reassuring regarding the concerns on a flu vaccination. Can you, Minister, give that same assurance that all the logistical operation that will be required for a COVID-19 vaccination programme will be in place and won't delay in any way vaccination programmes rolling out? Um, I, I, I thank the member, which I think is a very very topical and, and, and very apt question in regards to the vaccine. But, you know, as I've also said, while the vaccine does bring part of a solution, uh, we still have to take the, the guidance that we have there. That's why our regulations are still needed. That's why all that good health advice in regards to social distancing, face, face coverings, hand hygiene, respiratory hand hygiene is crucial. In regards to, to the vaccine, I will give the member the reassurance that until MRHA says this vaccine is safe to use, we will not be using it. But in regards to the development of the rollout of that vaccination programme, it is a large logistical operational challenge. Um, my department uh, gave a presentation to the executive last week in the preparations and highlighting the preparations that we have already made. And I will say to the member, they are impressive. Um, we have offered that same presentation to, to the Health Committee as well, because the level of detail that it has taken to get to this stage um, has come over a large number of logistical challenges. And the fact that um, one of the biggest challenges was be in the, in the AstraZeneca vaccine comes in batches of 975 uh, vials per, per box or per, per pack. Uh, and it will be highly challenging, if not impossible, to break that down into smaller packs. So it is a vaccine that is designed for mass vaccination and mass vaccination centres, which are going to put that initial challenge uh, on the delivery of our vaccine programme in Northern Ireland. And that's why we're also looking to the development and the coming on, on schedule of other vaccines so that we can utilise them fully as well in the different models that we are working up. Working up. But I will say to the member, um, since taking on and uh, um, becoming Minister of Health, I have been greatly impressed um, by the people across the health and social care service, when you see the dedication and level of detail that they have went into in preparing for this vaccine uh, mass delivery, it is impressive and something that I look forward to being shared by, by the health committee. And I think even being brought forward in, in a debate tomorrow in this house, where Mr. Speaker, I think I'm back again. Okay, you have well and welcome, Mr. William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the delays in to cancer treatment services due to COVID-19 and if preparation has been adequate for the second wave? Um, I, 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 take, no, I, I do take exception, um, to, to, and I don't think the member is implying it, uh, in regards to, to your statement. And I, I've said it before in this House, and it's been a matter of uh, an urgent oral, uh, Mr Speaker. There is ongoing work and challenges in regards to to the delivery of our services in regards to, to cancer. But I will be clear, and it was made clear when we were discussing our regulations, um, that those decisions are being made by clinicians on clinical need uh, for the patients presenting. Uh, so to cast, I think, any dispersion uh, on the professionalism or on the work of our health professionals, I think, uh, is an unfortunate one. And I know the member well enough to know that that's not not as an, his intention. But there are ongoing capacity challenges across the, the cancer pathway, which the service is actively managing. A surgical oversight group has been established within Northern Ireland Cancer Network with the aim of optimising capacity now 
and through any potential surge, and will provide ongoing clinical advice to the cancer reset cells. So I would like to reassure the member on this House that all possible steps are being taken to maintain services uh, in this second surge. However, it is likely that the redeployment of staff, staff absences, reduced access to theatres and patient reluctance to attend hospitals will all contribute to delays in pathways. Experience during the first surge suggests that the greatest impact is likely to be on invasive diagnostics and surgical treatment. So, dependent on the scale and continuation duration of this surge, there may be a requirement to increase independent sector capacity beyond the current contracted level. William Irwin, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank the Minister for his response. Uh, can I say to the Minister, just in Freddie Pass, I had a constituent who was diag- diagnosed just at the beginning of last week with cancer, uh, was told by medical staff they weren't sure when the treatment could start, but advised them to contact their local MLA to see could they help in some way. Does this not tell you that there are problems there, Mr. Minister? I think, obviously, when medical staff are advising uh, cancer, people that are diagnosed with cancer to go to their MLA to see could they help is an issue. I think, as I said to the member, I'm not denying um, there is an issue. Uh, I'm denying, or sorry, I am saying uh, that the challenge is that uh, we have an already overstretched health service. It was stretched before the pandemic and on COVID. Members were already, our patients and individuals of this community were al- already approaching uh, elected re- representatives in regards to access to surgeries and access to the health service. So what the member indicates is not something new. It's something that I experience and something I'm sure that every member of this House experiences as well. But what I will say to the member, how we get those those members of the general public seen quicker is to reduce the number of COVID patients that we're actually supporting within our, our health and hospital services. Again today, Mr Speaker, we still sit at over 400 inpatients, um, 39 still in ICU. If we can take all we can and all the steps and measures that we can in this House to reduce the rate of, tr- of transmission and of infection, we can get those services pro- and those provisions back on track as soon as it's practical and as soon as possible and as soon as it's safe. I call Karen Mullen. Minister, could I ask you for an update on the IVF operational group and its work to date? I, I think the, the member for her question it was one of the things that pre-COVID and pre-the pandemic that we had set up in regards to, to making, meeting the, com, the, the commitment under New Decade New Approach, which was to increase to three cycles of IVF. Unfortunately, one of the, I suppose one, one of the victims of, of COVID-19 was actually our IVF service within Belfast. It was paused, it was stepped down. Um, for a period of months, but is now recommenced and working on a reduced capacity. So the IVF working group and working uh, strategic group in regards to how we build up to those three cycles hasn't met uh, as we try to get the IVF facility and that procedure and service back on to scale uh, as soon as possible to meet the already latent demand uh, that we did unfortunately miss over a couple of months. Alan Mullen, supplementary. Minister for, for his answer and his response there and, and rightly as you highlighted COVID has delayed many of the treatments unfortunately for those awaiting IVF treatment this has added further delays in some cases running now on the, the years Minister can you assure us that you're looking at all options available uh, and would you look at directing uh, investment and the fertility services to improve and speed up the journey? Um, and that was, that was one of the things that the working group was specifically asked to look on because, as I said, it was a commitment under New Decade New Approach that we would move to those, the offer of three cycles. Uh, one of the challenges as well was moving to that age profile of women coming forward as well so they could actually access the service. It's something we're looking at because of the delays and the knock-on delays that have been caused due to the pandemic and the service actually being paused to make sure that nobody misses out uh, because of steps that were taken by us rather than any fault of their own. So that, that part of work, that work is all ongoing. There would also be, a, 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 I think it was a significant financial commitment under New Decade New Approach to move to those three cycles. So if the member can support me in that, ask to the Finance Minister uh, when my, my budget asks do come forward, it would be appreciated because it's definitely an ask that we're prepared to make. 
Eva Archibald. Um, can call you, and I thank the Minister for his responses so far. Could I ask the Minister if he will bring forward proposals um, for the introduction of free face coverings for lower income families? Um, I, I thank the Member, and it, it was actually one of those, those matters that was touched on uh, during the debate on regulations. It is not something that my, my Department has currently looked at, or the provision of free face coverings. There is guidance as to how members of the general public can actually go about making their own face covering, you know, cloth face coverings from the utilisation of T-shirts and other, other pieces of clothing. That was there from, I suppose, the early introduction of face coverings. It's advice and guidance that is there. But what I would say to those in workplaces as well, um, that they should be providing in their own workplace, there should be a provision um, of, of free, free face coverings. Uh, one of the things I'm not sure the member is aware of, there is also a, a proposal to put uh, 20% VAT back on PPE, which would have a significant impact, uh, not just on individuals or businesses, but our, our care homes or our health sector as well. And it's something I can say again that I'm working with the member's colleague as the Minister of Finance to try to challenge that at a Westminster level, because as we enter a second surge, to put that additional cost on PPE, I think would be unquestionable. Um, and particularly given that there are younger people who now face masks are, are mandatory, I would, I would urge the Minister to continue to look at that. Um, given the, the correlation there is between higher areas of deprivation and higher incidences of um, COVID, what learning has been gained by the Department of Health from the interdepartmental work on high levels of COVID in more deprived communities? No, and um, I thank the member, and it's a valid point. And I think it's something you know, in discussions with again your, 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 your ministerial colleague and the minister of communities, something that has has been recognised. And it's about the inequalities that COVID has highlighted across all our society. And I think it's uh, a, a duty, and it's something that even going forward, uh, in regards to the development of a programme for government. This should be looked across across the executive as to how we we tackle those inequalities. But it's also, I think, one of the one of the strengths that brings forward to our National Health Service, the National Health Service is free of point of use, free of point of delivery, and you don't have to pay, uh, for example, fifty euros to go and see a GP. So, so where there are, are those, those challenges financially uh, in areas of high deprivation in regards to access to work and access to other supports, I think one of the big benefits that we have here is our National Health Service. Well, John O'Dowd. Minister, last week you announced an inquiry into the urology services or one of the consultants services in regards to urology services at Craigavon Area Hospital. Can you give us an update in terms of how many patients, both private and public, are involved in that inquiry? Um, I, I thank the member for, for, for his question. Um, I did, as the member says, provide an oral statement to the Assembly on this matter on the, the 24th of November and announced my intention to establish a, a statutory public inquiry. Um, the Southern Health and Social Care Trust notified my department in July of this year of the clinical concerns in the relation to the work of, of a consultant, as the member says, who no longer works in the health service. To date, 1,159 patient records have been reviewed. 271 patients or families have been contacted, and the equivalent of nine SAIs have been identified. The work of the trust and safeguarding patients and identified for the concerns continues, with oversight being provided by the department's permanent secretary, who is leading the urology assurance group. Um, and regarding private patients, the department is working closely with the Southern Trust to ensure that there is a process in place for them to follow up to ensure that they can be confident of any health care services they were provided, and any private patients who are concerned should contact their GP or the trusts information line in the first instance. One minute left. Supplementary, John uh, Thank the Minister for his answer. Is the Minister in a position yet to announce the name of the Chair of the inquiry, and will he ensure that patient voices are involved in the design of the terms of reference? In, in quick response, I am not in the position to name a Chair, but I will give the guarantee and the assurance that patient voices will be heard as we establish and finalise the terms of reference of, of any public inquiry. Members, time is up. Please take your ease.